A wise man told me we are never given a dream without being given the power to make it true. You'll have to work for it, though. I'm Ron Schneider. Back in the 60s, I grew up around California theme parks, dreaming that someday I could make my living with that same kind of magic. In 1971, I got my first performing job at Magic Mountain. The 40 years that followed were one wild ride. And these are the stories of others who had that same dream and made it come true. Hi, welcome to Wild Rides. I'm Ron Schneider. In 1990, I was hired by Universal Studios to head up the Celebrity Lookalikes, the street entertainment area. We wanted to bring the characters to life. We didn't want just to have people walking around posing for pictures. So I was working with the Blues Brothers and the Marx Brothers and Marilyn Monroe, and my guest today was a most valuable asset to the group. Uh, he was our Oliver Hardy, Jamie McKenna. Jamie, no, over there. Jamie, welcome to Wild what? Rides. Oh, this is Wild Rides. This is, that's what this is. Oh, yes. it feels like a Wild Ride. This is great. What, um, tell, tell these nice people where I found you. Uh, you found me in, 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 uh, under a rock, really, <laughs> basically. Found me, I was working in a, an accounting office at the time and um, in the Florida area and um, basically, you know, just working at uh, trying to make a living. Um, and I had gone to some auditions to begin with. Um, uh, the audition, one audition was this, the big audition where you'd go in with like all hundreds of people and stuff like that. The cattle call. The, oh, the cattle call, right. I felt like cattle. Uh, but yeah. uh, you go in this audition and um, uh, basically you give your name, uh, what breakfast cereal you like, and off you go. And that was it. So uh, nothing came of that one, thank goodness. Uh, that was the tour guide. Mm -hmm. cattle call but although that's a great uh, great thing um, but I got called back again for another one uh, that had uh, I had my size had to go at a certain time so I come in I go I'm here for the one o'clock audition and they said they said oh um, your height comes at three o'clock so all right I came at three back at three o'clock I go in and I'm standing on the stage I don't know if you know this when, about this audition but I stand on stage you weren't there uh, Danny Burslaff was there and uh, we stand on the stage and we have all these tall people and a couple short people. And the person comes out and says, uh, uh, I think it was Sharon Miller who came out and says, you all are here to audition for Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. So I raise my hand. I go, all right, uh, Frankenstein. Uh, uh, I'm not tall enough. She goes, well, how tall are you? I said, oh, well, five. <laughs> this tall? Yeah, this, this, this tall. <laughs> And so I said, well, go ahead and do the audition. You never know. So uh, at the end of the audition, they, they picked all these numbers of the guys they liked. And then they pointed to me and said, oh, that one. And I go, I made the, 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 the <laughs> shortest, fattest Frankenstein. This will be great, you know. And then, of course, Danny got me aside and said, have you ever done Oliver Hardy? And uh, that's when he invited me to do a, uh, an audition, a private audition with you uh, that, the day that I came and did that one. So was, that was how it got set up first. He walks in to the audition, and I sit down in the, off, the meeting room with him, and I said, I took one look at him, and I said, can you do this? And he did that, and I said, you're hired, <laughs> because you're not going to find anybody who looks more like Oliver Hardy. And then you took the character and ran with it, just made him live, which is what I wanted in the first place. I, I wanted people who could take the characters and make them real in our time. Yeah. What was that process like for you? Well, the process was I've never really I've never really impersonated or did something like that before. I usually created characters of my own, and I was really kind of looking forward to doing that sort of thing. Um, I really didn't know what to expect when I when I got the job, uh, but doing Oliver Hardy. And at first, I must admit, I was kind of like a little bit, oh, well, I got to play a fat guy. But then I didn't really, because when I was younger, I didn't really study Lauren Hardy like I did the Three Stooges and the Little Rascals and all. And so I remember going home and putting that tape, because you gave me two weeks mm -hmm. to put something together. I put that tape in, and I couldn't stop laughing. I said, this, this is it. This is it. So the process was going home, researching as much as I could, um, reading the Babe book, all you know, the McCabe stories, stuff like that, and really studying, not so much memorizing their routines, but what's their thought process is what I really, really was trying to, to, to get. Um, in any situation, what would they do in this situation? Um, I didn't want to be an impersonator. I didn't want to be a lookalike. I wanted to be an actor taking this role 
as far as it can go. Uh, you know, when you do a movie, I'm sure they keep going till the end of the film. They do the character as strong as they can. I wanted that feeling to it, that it was real. That was like Oliver Hardy, if he's standing right here, would, would do this. Mm -hmm. That was the thing. I, I had never dealt with lookalikes either. And uh, I, when I came in, Danny Burslaff hired me in as a consultant first uh, to say, what would you do with these characters? He knew I was familiar with Laurel and Hardy and the team. And said, what would you do with these characters in the park? And I said, well, they, sh they shouldn't recreate. They should create anew with the guests. And it, I found out that the most important thing was not a physical resemblance, but uh, the being able to generate within the audience the feeling of being around that person. The best Marilyn Monroe. We had two Marilyn Monroes at the time. Yeah, yeah. One looked just like Marilyn, but the other one was Cynthia Hefner, mm -hmm. who could make any man feel like he was the sexiest thing in the world, and that was was every bit as valuable as uh, as uh, as anything else. And you just absolutely came on uh, as as Oliver Hardy right from the start um, with a variety of uh, Stan laurels. What was oh. it like going around from, <laughs> moving from one stand to another? Well, it's funny you say that uh, because I, I went and had a lot of Stan Laurels, mm -hmm. I think. In fact, if you, if you want to I can pick this up here, I'm going to shamelessly show you this wonderful book if you want to see, all right, two peas in a pod. Um, the writers of this book live in England, and that's Anthony and Joanne Waite, and they did a beautiful job. This is actually their second book, mm -hmm. and they have, a first, they have a first book, which they did second, instead of doing it first, which I don't understand why, but it's Laurel and Hardy. And a lot of these are impersonators <laughs> and stuff like this. And in this book, I think it says, it says Jamie McKenna and his seven Stan Laurels <laughs> in here, so if, if you want to get that book, you know, we can get information on that. But you know, uh, so seven Stan Laurels. I start off with Mike Andrew, um, amazing, uh, and each stand had their great value, you know. But uh, Mike Andrew was w was great with the music. So I remember I remember with the street still dirt in Hollywood Boulevard, hard hard steel shoe toe shoes, hard helmet, you know, our helmet for it. We're in the uh, we're in the Hollywood Boulevard area, going over routines and stuff like that. And he says to me, "So do you play an instrument?" And uh, you know, because I didn't, I was just studying Oliver Hardy at the time. I said, well, I play a guitar, I can do an upright bass, it's, it's, it's not funny, it's not funny. I said, well, I have a ukulele my dad has, you know, from Hawaii. That's funny, a fat guy with a small instrument. So I said, oh, all right, what are you going to play? Oh, I could play clarinet. I said, all right. So we put together a musical act, and we didn't just do their songs from the movie, we did like a lot of songs, like about 30 songs from that time period that we think they would have done, mm -hmm. and tried to do it like, you know, Laurel Hardy would. Twisted it a little bit. Twisted a little bit, yeah. Sometimes a lot, you know. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun, you mm -hmm. know. It really opened up a whole new entertainment. I mean, Universal sent us everywhere because we're kind of self-contained. Exactly, exactly. I remember the, the, the cruise on the big red boat. Oh, they sent us out on a, on a cruise with a big red boat. I got to go along, and I turned the, turned the boys loose. I said, go here, get in character, and go do something. And so they, you guys helped them bring the luggage on board People would come onto the ship, and there'd be all the luggage would be piled up, and there's Laurel and Hardy trying to sort the luggage and get it to the people's cabins. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people got the wrong luggage that day, <laughs> but they were laughing. They were laughing. Yeah, they were, they exactly. They, they were amused by the fact that <laughs> they, they couldn't, were, couldn't find anything that they owned. <laughs> um, so then you, we got into uh, re, you, your skills as a prop builder were so important. Um, the, well, I, the fact, I said to you guys up front, I said, I, I want to be a fan. I just want to go out in the park and you guys surprise me. You guys bring the characters to life. And you just excelled at that. Uh, you'd walk out in front of the park and there'd be the two of them sitting on the edge of a fountain with fishing poles, just fishing as the guests were arriving in the morning, fishing in a fountain. Um, there was the bit, tell them about the bit with, with the boat, with the, with oh, the rowboat. Yeah, the boat. Uh, when Universal uh, built everything, they they had this they had this uh, lake, you know, where they did the stunt show and everything like that. At the time, it was a water show, and they had all these props along the shore. So basically, uh, you know, creative said, you know, they opened doors said, go create. So me and Mike had an idea. We saw this rowboat on the side of the on the side of the building there, and said, let's take that out and do a whole fishing routine, you know. 
and got a really good crowd getting us in the boat, watching us doing this whole fishing thing. And we had the, the fishing poles and there's a couple paint cans because someone was painting in there or something. So we take the boat out right in the middle of the lagoon. And all of a sudden we're doing, starting this fishing routine and this, this leak springs up in the, in the boat and it's just, it starts sinking, you know? And so he- I didn't know this one. Oh, you didn't know this one? No. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, that water is coming out. So he takes the paint cans and he's, he's literally taking the water and splashing it in my face, oh, trying no. to get, you know, the water out of the boat. Oh, no. And I'm trying to paddle, trying to, you know, so it was, it was like a real Lauren Hardy routine. It was really funny. And people were laughing like it was, it was meant to be. And so we finally got the boat up to shore and he gets out of the boat and all that water shifted and the boat went up, spun over on my head in the water. That was the nastiest water I ever tasted. Oh, that's the worst. That's yeah. the worst. No, the one I was thinking was the whitewashing. Oh, that yeah, you, they, 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 they came up with, um, with a pair of overalls, and they went out with buckets of whitewash, yep. and they whitewashed the boat. And you would take your lunch sitting out there. Instead of going on a break, you'd sit out there, eat your lunch, covered with whitewash. <laughs> you had handprints all over the back of, of the suit. It Everywhere, just, yeah. It was just priceless. And then you built a music box. We built a music box. Actually, the first one, we, because uh, me and Mike said, well, let's go ahead and, and make something that is, is going to be something like the music box. We'll do our own routine to it, you know. So shipping gave us a box to work with. And it was a little bit smaller. So we said, let's make it funnier and, and, and make it, instead of a piano, let's make it a melodeon. Well, melodeon is much smaller, but it has all these mechanisms to make the, the, the wheels run and everything. So it's actually a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. No one really got the joke. And on the outside, we put it Finlayson's Music Box Company. And we delivered it uh, right with the Blues Brothers doing the show mm -hmm. right now. And we delivered it to this little music store right there. And we started this routine with it, and it, it would smash over, and, and I, it would land on my back, and he'd jump on top of it. And it, it was very physical, very physical. And you used that to get to lunch. You used that to get to lunch, yeah, right? Yeah, they'd, right. they'd roll it from the trailer where we were out to the employee cafeteria. Then when they were finished with lunch, they'd roll it back across, and that was their way of getting out to lunch. That's right. And then we even did a test once to see how, how powerful it was to have something like a prop like this. And what people know Lauren Hardy is, we waited till no one was on that street, and this cobblestones are really big. And we pushed that thing, and it was just like, bang, 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 bang. By the time we looked up, there was a huge crowd, uh -huh. a huge crowd. So it was a lot of fun. Mm. A lot of fun. Creating those things, you know. Now, from leaving Universal Studios, which you actually never have, <laughs> no. but um, you've been creating other characters, one after another. Talk about some of those. Oh, um, well, you know, um, you know, you, you open yourself up to doing a lot of things, uh, being a, a, a heavier character. Um, let's see, um, we put together a Gilligan's Island cast, you mm -hmm. know, so I, I played Skipper, which is not a far fetch because I think um, uh, in our relations, um, the, the Skipper's, uh, Alan Hale Jr., mm -hmm. his dad actually played the waiter in the scene in there. Oh, yeah. So he had, yeah, so he had this connection, and that's why you wonder why Gilligan and Skipper kind of was like a mm -hmm. Laurel and Hardy. You know, mm -hmm. he, had, he had the takes of the camera and everything. So it kind of was in the family. Mm -hmm. So we did that, and uh, other characters, you know, of course I did um, Jake Blues mm -hmm. for a short time. Mm -hmm. And you remember how, how that happened, right? Uh, remind me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we had we had the first Jake Blues we had um, it was amazing. He, he looked like it was like reincarnated. He looked exactly like John Belushi. The problem yeah. was, he was exactly like John Belushi. Yeah. 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 So yeah. he didn't last so, very long. Well, he had to, he had to go somewhere on <laughs> holiday or something. Uh, <laughs> so we'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, um, so. And, and uh, I'm doing Oliver Hardy one day in the park, and uh, Ron comes up to me and says, uh, so I, I understand you um, you uh, have done Jake Blues or something? No, kind of, yeah, sort of. You know the tunes? Yeah, I know the tunes, yeah. Great, you're going on tonight with this band called Paradise. I said, <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay, let's get on and do this then. So me and Keith Kobe, who's amazing, Keith Kobe, talent beyond belief, musician, had been in bands too and all that stuff and and he just we put it together he, he he steered me through the whole songs and we went on we did that show we did that i think it was three or four numbers or something like that mm -hmm. and it was really good and we got in the car driveway and i could see ron's face as a pass by he's going like because <laughs> you'd only seen me at the time as, mm -hmm. as oliver hardy mm -hmm. you know so it's like and that was a switch i don't think i was the best jake at the time because to switch on real quick like that but 
I think I carried it pretty good. You were certainly the only Jake at the time. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. So you're the best we had. Yeah, yeah, something else, something else. That that was fun. So a lot of characters um, going through things. I got to the point too where as I started uh, forming uh, some groups, like some musical comedy acts, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I was um, I, I co-producer, creator, and co-producer of a Swamp Billy type band, which had done great things. We to open up for Charlie Daniels and stuff like that. And then I had, a, of course, I still have a pirate band that we play piratical music. In fact, we just played Margaritaville over there. It's comedy, it's actors who play uh, instruments, you know, and we, we sort of build our own characters with that one. But yeah, a lot of uh, characters. So you've taken, uh, from this first job as a performer at Universal back in 1990, you've built an entire life where you're now full-time performer and uh, doing uh, numerous characters. Uh, there, what words would you share with people who are interested in getting into this end, this end of the business? Um, you know, yeah, uh, well, when we did, when we were performing, we had that a lot of people come up to us and they would say, um, well, how can I do that? What, what do I have to do? And they, they always wanted to know, and basically it's, it's very simple. You can't really walk someone through it. You just have to say, study your role that you want. Go in there and just do it. I mean, it's basically simple. It's just, you, you do it. Um, get people to watch you, tape yourself. Um, more research, the better. Um, it's kind of like I they look a lot of lookalikes come out and they're very good, but they there's still there's something missing, um, and there has to be a, a great passion and love for what you're doing. First of all, I think Stan Laurel said that he he saw two guys came up to him and they did impersonations of them. And he says, "What do you think? What do you think?" He goes, "Lads, you did a really good job, but you know what? You're missing one thing, and that's the love. You need the love for it. First of all, so you get that passion in there, and try not so much to." to be performing as somebody, but just try to become them, think like them. Um, it's a process that some, some people can turn on like that, and some people really have to get into, you know. Uh, if I'm doing Laurel and Hardy, I really have to uh, take the time and really think and, and act like Oliver Hardy. Maybe a week, I think I drive my wife nuts when I, I'm like, if I do an English character, I gotta speak that language for, like, for a week or two, or if I'm doing mm -hmm. Oliver Hardy, I have to get in that mode of doing you know, Oliver Hardy, so that I can keep my thought process. Because the less you have to think on when you're doing that, mm -hmm. the more you can let it go and concentrate on what you're choosing to say and do. Just so be in the moment. Be in the moment. Yeah. Be in the moment. This is the thing that I, that I tried when we started out. I said to you guys, you're inheriting uh, the, the life and work of a very famous person. And it's a tremendous responsibility that, you know, it costs us a fortune to pay for the rights for these characters. Oh, yeah. And I was looking for people who could make them come to life. And the, of the of original crew, I think just, just about everybody uh, took that on seriously. And we had the most amazing crew of people. And when Universal opened, uh, the rides, as everyone knows, wasn't quite working the way it was supposed to. But uh, you guys were on the front row and, and making it work right across the board. Uh, it was a very exciting time, especially especially since we were Universal Studios, um, we could get away with all this stuff. Oh yeah, you know, we oh, yeah. Uh, we could say, look, I had no idea you were in that boat sinking in the middle of the lagoon. <laughs> Disney would never let you guys get away with that, or with anything that the Marx Brothers did, or the Blues Brothers. Um, it was uh, it was a it's a golden time. It was. And um, I'm very very lucky to have been a part of it. Yeah. What that you can discuss are you working about working on now? Um, well, I, I, I don't really go into much detail as far as exactly what I'm doing, but I am, I mean, I am acting at Universal Studios. Um, you can see me readily um, uh, performing, um, but, uh, and it's a wonderful world I'm performing in. Um, and it's really magical, too. It's just great to do this character that I'm doing over there with some other very talented people, of course. Um, but you can come over there and see me performing. I really don't want to say too much because, you know, you give away. I might have too many fans there for autographs and photographs, and, <laughs> or bill collectors, or you know, ex-wives, or yeah. So I, I don't want to say where I exactly work, but yeah, I've been at Universal ever since, and uh, 30 years, over 30 years now. And this is your COVID beard. This is my COVID beard. That's right. I grew it because I I just didn't want to shave. You know, it's so much to do with the COVID period. You know. I know the feeling. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, I can't wait to see you without it and get you back in. Uh, in the mustache. 
Oh, yeah. Well, that's coming up. I got to tell you, because we're going to, you know, we still have the conventions of the fan club called mm -hmm. Sons of the Desert. Mm -hmm. Sons of the Desert. After, it's named after one of their movies they did. And uh, they all meet. I mean, I, we perform a lot uh, in, in Europe. Uh, as Laurel and Hardy still, mm -hmm. um, and we perform a around uh, America too as well for these conventioneers, and they show up by the hundreds and thousands sometimes to a lot of these these uh, fans, and the next one's going to be 2021. It's supposed to be 2020, mm -hmm. but it changed to 2021 in Providence. So all you have to do is look up 2021 conventions, uh, you know, uh, Sons of the Desert. Laurel and Hardy, and you'll get some information on it. And I, I, everyone's welcome to come. In fact, you you apply. You, you, the, Providence is going to be great. It's going to be like the Mayflower. So we might do some Mayflower ideas with with the outfits they did. Because I think they did a still. Stan was in like a woman's outfit for a pilgrim, and Ollie was in the regular pilgrim. Mm -hmm. So that might be kind of fun. Talk about your 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 big fan, Jerry Lewis. Oh, Jerry Lewis. And how you guys hooked up with him? Well, we have hooked up with Jerry Lewis through Mike Andrew. Um, I, I'll try and be quick as this is possible. It was really funny. We were, we were driving to do a show with Mike Andrew in Daytona Beach, and I found these th those Bubba teeth, you know, those fake mm -hmm. Bubba teeth. And it actually was uh, Jerry Lewis, Bubba teeth. On mm -hmm. And who would know who that is, you know? So I put it in my mouth in the car, and I turn to Mike and go, ah, I do a very poor Jerry Lewis. And so he goes, where did you get those teeth? I said, well, I got them here. I got you a pack, too. And he goes, you don't understand. I made cardboard teeth when I was a kid. Uh, the Nutty Professor is my, my, my favorite all time. And he just went on this whole story about it. And so it just, it juiced him to go ahead and write this whole show, uh, a stage version of Nutty Professor for The Fringe here in Orlando. And so he sent all this stuff to Jerry Lewis. And long story short, he'll have to tell you all the details. But long story short, here he is now. He's, he's uh, working with Jerry Lewis, putting on uh, the off-Broadway version of Nutty Professor mm -hmm. for Broadway, you know. And, uh, I, and so I'm in, I, and what happened next was when they were rehearsing all this stuff, I got invited to do a show in Vegas on, on a stage with other lookalikes. So I called Mike and said, Mike, are you going to be in Vegas with Jerry? He goes, yes. You want to come out and do Stan Laurel with me? And so we did Stan Laurel there, and he goes, I got a great idea. Let's go to Jerry's office, and we'll surprise him. Uh, are you sure Jerry's going to like surprises? <laughs> yeah, he'll love it. He'll love it. So we go to Jerry's office in Vegas, and also we brought along with him because Jerry's a big Lauren Hardy fan. Because mm -hmm. uh, you see in his office pictures of Lauren Hardy, Stan Laurel, everywhere. And he's also a big Charlie Chaplin fan. Mm -hmm. And so who was there doing a show with me? But Billy Scadlock, one of the finest chaplains I think I've ever mm -hmm. seen. And we took him with us, and we hid, and he wasn't even there yet. We hid in his office, and Mike says, everybody get on the table when he comes in, under the table, so he doesn't oh see my. us. So Jerry comes in, and he goes, Mike, where are you? We got to get to work on this show. And Mike's standing there, Stan Lawrence, he's, he's, he's like going, hi, Jerry. He goes, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. And then, uh, and right away I stood up and go, well, now you did it. You gave us away. Oh, my <laughs> God. And he goes, now, right, Jerry, you go into your office, and we write in, we have something to show you. He goes, oh, my God. I kept saying that the whole way to his office. So we go in. Billy's still hiding there, trying to take pencils <laughs> with Jerry Lewis's name, office name on it. He kept putting them in his pocket. And so we go into the office, and um, we do our magic show. We have this magic show oh, I remember. that you helped us write with yeah. it, too, in the beginning. And it just kind of grew from there. And we did the magic show in his office. And the whole time, he sat like this. <laughs> and we were done with the show. He does this. And then Mike goes, so how do we do, how do we do, Jerry? And he, and he looks at me and goes, come here, sit down. So I sat right in front of Jerry and I go, hello, Mr. Lewis. Don't call me Mr. Lewis. Call me Jerry. So I said, all right, Jerry. Um, so so what do you think? Uh, can I give you some advice so that will help you in this career to reach higher heights? And I said, well, I, I would love it. That'd be amazing. I'd be totally honored. Amazing. And he goes, when you saw the rings, saw them sideways. <laughs> and I go, sideways. Mm -hmm. He goes, sideways. And he goes, <laughs> so I, I, 
I go, thank you, Mr. Jerry, thank you very much. And I left that day going, I said to Mike, did he like it? I don't, Are you kidding? <laughs> he loved it. If he didn't like it, he would have said, you should seek a career in the movie industry <laughs> selling tickets. <laughs> he loved it. Yeah. So I, I'm driving, I'm doing a show in New York about a week later. I'm driving in this limousine to do this show with this guy. And uh, I get this call and it's Mike Andrew. I go, hi, and I hear this, hi, you don't call me no more. What's up with that? All right, Michael, you sound like Jerry, okay. And you hear Mike's in the background going, uh, Jerry, uh, would you give me my phone, please? Jamie doesn't want to talk to you, he's busy. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, Jerry, amazing. And then when Mike did the show in, in, in Nashville, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I went back, and I actually I wore this outfit mm -hmm. to see Mike Andrew's opening show for Nutty Professor. And Jerry was in, in, in the backstage after the show. He goes, come back and see Jerry, come back and see Jerry. And me and my wife went to see Jerry. And, 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 I, and he says, you remember Jamie, right? You remember Jamie? He goes, you wore that to the opening? And I said, <laughs> yeah, but don't worry, I took the hat off so they could see over my big head. And he goes, thank God. <laughs> but what a great, I mean, what an honor. I mean, what an amazing honor. This, is, this guy is so famous, you know, and so amazing. His career is just... The magic act that you guys did is on YouTube. It is on yes, YouTube. Yes, look it up. That's very funny, and you'll see some of the magic act that they that they created in the characters. Jamie, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, this my is pleasure, my pleasure. And, inspiring. and I know we can go on forever about things and some things we shouldn't say. <laughs> and we're going to say them <laughs> as soon as this is over. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Rod Schneider, and uh, if you follow your bliss, you're in for one wild ride. Go ahead, Ollie. Flip your tie. Flip my tie. Huh. <laughs>